presentation. I will move on now to the next speaker, who is a, a great honor also to, to introduce to you is Professor Andreas Diakon from Stellenbosch University in South Africa. And he's going to tell us about the South African BCG trial. So warmly welcome to you, Andreas. It's a great pleasure. Um, thank you, um, and thanks to previous spe speakers for uh, for their presentations, which makes it much easier for me to actually go forward here. So this is the South African uh, trial uh, founded by the EDCTP. Um, we had, of course, very similar rationale and objectives. We wanted to see if BCG revaccination in our context can reduce the infection rate and or the disease severity in frontline healthcare workers um, in South Africa. So the sitting, yeah, so the, the green part here is, is South Africa and you see the Western Cape there in, in the Southwest. We had two sites in the city, that's a four million city with two very large uh, hospitals. The one that, that was, was called TASC, the other one was the University of Cape Town uh, Lung Institute and we had another smaller site in a, in a town called George, a little bit more in the east at the coast. And we recruited from healthcare facilities, hospitals, clinics. We were, we were targeting frontline workers, so people that would be at risk of exposure because of the working environment they were in. And we were, we were uh, relatively inclusive, so we didn't only want nurses and doctors. We wanted everyone, even if, if people worked in the, in, the, in the kitchens or in maintenance. As long as you were employed on the hospital grounds and you were considered an essential worker, you could be part of our study. So the design, we had HIV negative frontline workers, HIV negative because BCG is not officially uh, allowed or registered for HIV positive people. We aimed for 1000 participants, 500 per arm. We had a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial. The Danish BCG strain, very similar to, to other trials. You all know how this is given. We had uh, 52 weeks of follow-up, uh, that uh, slide that, I mean, I showed us wasn't quite correct for us. This wasn't half a year, it was an entire year. Um, then we were looking at serology and most of our assessments were actually done over the telephone. Uh, at the end, end of the day, we did WhatsApps and phone calls most of the time. So how did we fit into the pandemic? Um, this, this is one of the waves, that gray area that we uh, we had in our area and we recruited right through that. I think they call it the first wave. So in May 2020, we started in July 2020, we had about 50% and in October we had included uh, all, all the participants. And uh, one of the outcomes that we were interested in was the primary, is, is the hospitalization due to COVID-19. And what we did a bit different from other studies is that we actually wanted to know if people had uh, COVID or other respiratory tract infections, how the course of these was. So we, we would then, as soon as we knew that somebody had a respiratory illness, we would contact them weekly to find out if they were in that week at mild, moderate, severe, if they actually were hospitalized and how severe the course was in hospital. So for every week during a, a respiratory tract infection, we had a school. Uh, according to, to that scale. Obviously, we wanted to know about the safety of PCG and the association with zero conversion and latent tuberculosis and other covariates. That's something I can't present today because we haven't quite finished that analysis. So what was, was particular in our study compared to others is that we, we, we called it a revaccination study because in the South African environment, every healthcare worker would have been uh, exposed to a BCG vaccination uh, in, in their lives, uh, in theory. So we, we are not obviously not able to prove that everybody was, but we call our study a revaccination study um, just because of the context. So we were interested in tuberculosis also, which is something I can't, uh, I can't present because I don't have the results. There is a very high rate of latent tuberculosis in our population, about 50% expected, and that might actually be an additional uh, protector, this constant uh, small exposure, and actually a lot of our patients would have had tuberculosis in the past or at least latently infected. Then we did that regular health status assessment as I just showed you. And perhaps another thing was that we 
We didn't uh, test the participants for COVID when they had respiratory infections themselves, but we relied on them to access the normal testing that was offered by the government or private companies. And then we, we uh, got these results from them. So that this ac approach actually worked, you, you can see that on the left, um, the antigen tests that were done, you know, initiated by the participants themselves are, are the green wave. And that's not perfectly shown here, but these were, are perfectly mirroring the waves that we had uh, in our epidemic. The first, the first wave there on the left would be the first, when they were recruited and there was another bigger wave during follow-up. And so the rate of positive tests also followed nicely the trains that the government was seeing. So we are very confident that the way we assist this uh, actually worked. So again, the endpoints hospitalization due to COVID-19 was our primary respiratory tract infections, COVID-19 antigen positivity and serology conversion. This was the main things we were interested in and how we assisted was that we, we did it, these uh, serology uh, at screening and we and later at baseline weeks 10 I see there 26 and 52 and uh, at least for weekly we contacted the participants via whatsapp or phone call and the antigen testing was self-initiated uh, as I said move on from here. So these were our participants, 500 and 500, 70% were females, age, uh, BMI, job categories, you know, 69% were not nurses or doctors. The race you can see there, and this is this mirrors pretty much what you see if you walk into a South African healthcare facility, you see exactly the people as they would be expected here. Expected here. Um, I was a bit surprised about how many uh, had a history of hypertension, asthma, diabetes, or were smoking 27%. That's another disaster one should probably look at uh, at some point. Latent TB infection with a uh, quantiferon test we found in 48% at baseline. The BCG for a score we could find verify in 49% of the participants and at uh, baseline 15% of our participants were uh, SARS-CoV-19 seropositive, which is something we only found out later when the tests became available. Initially, we just saved the serum for testing later. The outcomes, and I'm already at the results. So um, BCG was obviously, as everybody knows on this webinar, probably a bit difficult to, uh, to do a blinded study with. So probably 90% or more of people with BCG got a site reaction that gave away what they were actually having. It was only severe and um, that's, that was acceptable. I thought uh, COVID-19 events, we had 192 of whom 27 was, was considered severe on our scale or worse, you know, that uh, three or more. And then we had RTIs a lot more and that a lot of them were not actually COVID related. So 958 of whom 33 were severe and 47 people were hospitalized due to COVID was 15. That was our main uh, outcome. Four people died and they were all on placebo. Two of those died from COVID-19. That was correct on that slide that I showed. Um, other events by more than a thousand. So we captured a lot of, of, of noise on that study. And I think the study was worked very well with uh, the WhatsApps and the phone calls to capture the events. The zero conversion uh, for COVID we found in 33%, which it's also more or less expected from the population. So it, it looks like we recruited the right people who were indeed exposed. Um, we had the, the disturbance of COVID-19 vaccinations that uh, were introduced in follow-up and 68% of our participants actually accessed it, which was uh, a lot, but the, the healthcare workers in South Africa were first offered vaccinations to, in a government supported program. So a lot of them accessed that. And uh, long COVID was reported by 35, 80% of the COVID cases we had. So that's the results. And uh, as it was already shown, we had no significant results. So hospitalization, you can see hospitalization, all causes, PCR confirmed COVID-19, respiratory tract infections. None of this is significantly different between BCG and placebo. And the trends are towards BCG actually 
making it more likely for these events to happen, but it's far from any, any statistical significance. We actually looked at this and the study would have had to be something like between five and 10 times greater to make this anywhere close to significant. More results, this is a, a Markov uh, model that our statistical team in Uppsala, who supported us brilliantly during that study, uh, designed. And this, this will still be further uh, worked on. So you can see here how over time in follow-up uh, the trains emerge um, and that BCG is a little bit more frequent uh, on the left for hospitalization, um, for the probability of having a PCR-confirmed infection and and the respiratory tract infection, but the, you can see how much the, the confidence intervals overlap. So what we will use these graphs for is for mainly for the comor comorbidity or the covariate analysis. So now if you include if a person had a COVID-19 vaccine, if a person was, was positive uh, in the latent TB test, you could probably see these lines move up and down with the covariates and they could then be a number given to how much the lines are moved up and down by a specific covariate, which can also be the gender, the age, com comorbidities of any kind. But we are still working on that analysis. So this is a, probably the last uh, very complicated slide I have. Um, so we have these health statuses. Uh, zero is normal, one was mild, two was moderate, perhaps you remember. And uh, so lumped here together are three to seven because they were the severe or hospitalized uh, thing. So in the outer ring, somewhere you see HS, health status zero, that's in the, in the southeast there. And then one and two and three to seven. And this, this shows how people moved between these health statuses. Everybody starts at zero and then goes somewhere and comes back. You know, and, and so we didn't see any difference between placebo and BCG with these arrows, except there was one um, exception it was that people on BCG they moved a little bit faster from health status one to higher or what is it there on the numbers there from zero from healthy to three to seven or from two to three to seven so they they when they became ill they became ill slightly faster um, which translated as we have seen in no clinical relevant worse outcomes but it's just an observation that we made and because i like to show at least something significant i'll show it to you you can but i don't think this means much uh, in the context of a overall actually negative study so these are the conclusions we had no difference in the relevant covid-19 outcomes between placebo and bcg vaccination these were all healthcare workers so the group is not um, one of elderly people or otherwise selected people at high risk they are relatively young and they are reasonably fit because they have to work in the hospital and they are frontline workers um, you all know what such people look like um, we had a robust methodology, I thought, and it worked very well. And we had very few patients that were lost to follow up. And I thought we captured a lot of events. And it's, it's to me, I, I don't think we have to repeat that study. It's just negative in the way we did it in healthcare workers. So what we're still preparing is um, the association of these outcomes with the covariate, for instance, the TB status, the, the COVID zero conversions, the comorbidities, and that will uh, at some point be presented uh, after that the work in Uppsala is completed. Okay, and this just leaves me to thank everyone, the statistical team in Uppsala that uh, helped us, the patients or the participants that participated, and our sister site at the University of Cape Town. And there's probably a few of you listening. I can't list you all, but you know who you are, and I know who you are, and I thank you very much uh, for helping. Also, the organizers of this webinar for inviting us. It's actually quite uh, an honor for us to be invited on that stage to present our results. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andreas. It's a great honor to have you here on this webinar and hear this presentation from yourself. It was great. Uh, I, I'm full of questions, but now I also have to respect that there are uh, questions arriving in the Q&A and, and also to me privately. So let me start out by asking a question, which I am also burning to hear an answer to it. It's actually a, a more general question uh, also to the two, to, to both uh, the last speakers uh, from Prado here, who asked if it's possible to classify participants as TB naive versus exposed, uh, and I could add BCG scar positive versus BCG scar negative, and then analyze uh, whether it, it uh, matters with BCG in that mm -hmm. context. Because I, I couldn't help noticing that 
you know, you have what I would anticipate from a well-applied BCG vaccine, 93% of your participants in the trial developed a skin reaction, but where, well, you stated they were all BCG vaccinated, but actually only 49% of them had a BCG scar. I know they can vanish over time, but still there, there seems to be some, uh, a large proportion who didn't have a scar. Could they in fact have not been correctly BCG vaccinated uh, in childhood? And, and could you stratify your analysis whether, based on whether they were either BCG scar or TB positive, uh, and, and then look if BCG has the same effect in those with and without uh, positivity. Uh, it's an excellent question, and, and uh, it, 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 we are working on that analysis. Um, actually, the trial was specifically designed to, to give us the numbers and data we need to do that uh, covariate analysis, and it's still ongoing. These are very complex models that actually have to be created first. Uh, and, and, and you know what helped, what didn't really help was this, the rapid rollout of the COVID-19 vaccines, which I think is actually the biggest covariate that is going to be, have, that we will have to adjust for before we can make any calls about the latent TB status and, and the SCAR. You know, that's why we collected all this data. We, we have it, but it's all one large data set that needs to be worked on uh, by our pharmacometrists who are doing this, this diligently. And I have seen some, preliminary results and it doesn't seem that the TB state just makes a large difference. If any, then it's uh, it's a small one. But they, they're working on it and, um, and perhaps the other questions. Yes, we're calling our study a revaccination study because it has been national policy. We do not have um, data that people have been vaccinated. I, I don't think most of our hospital workers would be able to produce a document you know, proving that they were. and. Uh, so that's that's it. Um, we call it a revaccination study. For all of you, we know we really only know about perfect those who have a scar that they were vaccinated. But there might be some that where the scar was lost. They have been vaccinated with a mechanism that didn't leave a scar. You know, um, but most of them, South Africa isn't a great immigrant country. So so it's. Uh, it's most likely that they were in the system and someone has been vaccinated, perhaps 80%. It's hard to, hard to tell. Thank you very much. I have a question from Eleanor Fish. Would you unmute yourself, Eleanor? Hi there. Great talk. Thank you, Andreas. So, I mean, one of the issues that I think uh, many of us are considering is that um, the, what's the effect of infection COVID-19 on the transition or the progression from latent to pulmonary uh, mm. TB and whether revaccination and whether you can tease it out, whether revaccination might in the context of COVID, what might the outcome be? I wonder whether you consider that. Yeah, um, ha. thank you for that one. So um, there was not a single TB case in follow-up. All right, that's something I know, so we won't be able to tell you. Then in the consortium, we had a long, long discussion if we should do a similar thing to, to what Mina I did and ask the participants to be followed up for perhaps 10 years, you know, to, to see if, if that data set that we had with very document, well-documented patients would eventually show a signal. And I must admit that I voted against doing that, <laughs> mainly because of the, the sample size. We, we looked a bit at the uh, expected incidence of TB in healthcare workers and looked at the 1,000 participants we had of whom, you know, then you compartmentalize it. Now you have 250 that had a BCG scar and had latent TB and had a COVID vaccine or had BCG re or not. And then the, the, the groups become very small. Suddenly you're down to 125 per, you know, segment. And then in 10 years, you would assume that you're going to lose 20, 30% from follow-up, you know, and we thought that at the end of the day, the numbers would be so small that we would be impossible, it would be impossible to tell anything. If the study had been 10 times bigger, it would have been such a nice thing to do. Really, I would have loved to do it. Um, but, you know, there's real life constraints and we had to pull that line. But it's a great question. Thank you. Maybe we can address that together in our opinion and, and mm. 
Mozambican cohorts as yeah. well. well. We'll discuss that at a later stage. For now, we have reached the time of the break. I've had a great time so far in this first set. I look forward to seeing everybody for the second set in 10 minutes time. Thank you so much. <laughs>